some pictures from NASA, pictures I had seen other places, and I began to take books out of the library, books written by the astronauts. And uh, I read with a very critical eye, and I started to dissect them. And I was going, uh, uh, mm, mm. One of the things that leaped out pretty quick, I can't remember the book it's in now. I have it all footnoted in my book, which, which is, of course, is NASA Moon of America. Center on down. And uh, what happened is as they landed on the moon in this metallic contraption, which was sitting there, and they claim it was early in the morning, so the sun was low on the horizon. But when you have a thing on an open plane and the sun hits it, in the morning, it hits it at right angles because it's low. And immediately, that thing begins to heat from the solar radiation. And they claim that they couldn't even sleep in this metallic contraption in a place where the sun will drive the soil temperature up to 250 degrees. Okay? Now, because they were cold. See, they were too cold to sleep. And I'm looking at this and saying, how could that be? So, one thing led to another. Uh, I, I also found books written by ex-government scientists, one of whom very de definitely states that there's a radiation problem out in space, that whenever that sun throws a little fit, a little solar storm, that the amount of radiation is vast and immense and that you would need six feet of shielding all around you because x-rays do what they call diffract to keep you alive from even a medium solar storm, or even a little one for that matter, solar flare, solar storm. So when the Rand Corporation first contacted me, uh, I got a letter that said something like, oh, bright Mr. Inventor. At the time, I was a member of Mensa, which is the High IQ Society, and I'm also an inventor with two granted patents without any large corporation type help. And it said, NASA, Poor NASA would like some free ideas on space if you have any to donate. So I did. I sent in three or four. I didn't keep any records. And I never received a confirmation that they had received them, which began to rankle me a little bit. Uh, it takes time to write an idea. I gave them time. I gave them ideas. And they didn't say, gee, thanks for the submission. So the years go by, and we had already moved to New Jersey from Florida. And one day I received this book from the government, America at the Threshold, and it had been forwarded from my, our previous Port Ritchie address. And I read it through, and of course what I found out is, is that it was a tout that NASA intended to take a manned mission to Mars. Now, that turned me off a little bit because I was already beginning to doubt the, the previous Apollo moon missions. And the other thing bothered me was the rover, the way they, they would push the pedal to the metal and the wheels would churn and the dust and gravel would fly, which we did plenty of, of as kids here. We were all, every, every red light was a, was a drag race. And that dust and gravel hit the moon's surface just as fast as it would here on Earth, but the moon only has one-sixth gravity. I took a look at this book and on page A51, in the appendix, if I can find it. <sighs> Last time. On page A51 in the appendix, right smack in the center of the page is my name, Ralph Renee. And it says here I'm an outreach participant. What, what it means is that at least one of my ideas that I su submitted went through three to four sequential screening committees in past. But as far as being an outreach participant, well, when I had done this thing, they weren't talking about Mars anymore. So I, I didn't participate in outreach. I sent them a free idea like they asked for. So when I saw my name here, I got very aggravated because I, I no longer really truly believed that we had even gone to the moon. One of the other things that you'll find in every moon picture you ever look at from the Apollo landings is footprints in fairly deep dust. Now, the prints are extremely clear and they're ridged. And yet they'll swear to you that they only sank into the dust the eighth of an inch. And yet when you look, your eyeball can see that they had really big cleats on their rubber type sneakers. And that they had to be in deeper than that because the, the print's totally clear. 
So the eighth of an inch is the biggest eighth of an inch I've ever seen. The other thing is they claim that the moon is bone dry, which it should be because of the vacuum and the temperatures that it hits. At, in, in even a partial vacuum, the, the boiling point of water drops like crazy. On the moon, water just cannot exist. No matter what they're telling you now about polar caps here and there, water itself cannot exist. The first time the sun gets anywhere near it, it will boil right away immediately. The pressure is zero. You have to be near some wet dirt or wet sand before you leave real footprints. Right at the edge of the water in the ocean, if you have some fine sand there, you can leave your full footprint arch and all. But if you get up the beach where it's dry, even five, six feet, what do you leave? You leave a pockmark in the sand. And the other thing that began to really bother me is the fact that these, these lunar landers, LEMS, weigh 33,000 pounds. They float down to the moon on one single central jet, and that jet does not blow a crater. It doesn't even sweep away this loose dust. How can that be? Now, now that when the central jet was roaring, bringing down that mass way down to the moon, uh, there was much more than a half a pound of pressure, and the volume of it is tremendous. That bell is like two, three feet across the nozzle of this engine. But it didn't blow away the loose sand and, and, and dust. How could this be? Because you will see pictures with the footprints almost under that jet. What did they do? Carefully sweep everything it blew away back in there? The original NASA engineers, the Germans that we first imported after the war, the World War II, wrote a book. Uh, I have the footnotes in my book. I can't remember what it's called right now. But there was one whole section on, on space radiation. And they claimed that even a minor solar flare could put as much as 100,000 rem. And 500 is, is classed as enough to kill a human being through a quarter inch of hull. Well, the command ship didn't have a quarter inch hull. It had a few thousandths of an inch uh, an aluminum based compound. The LEM did not have a quarter inch hull. It had a few thousandths of an inch. And surely their space suits were only cloth, even though they claimed they put some metallic threads in them and this was to protect them from the radiation. But a claim is not proof. If, if those suits could have stopped that radiation, we would have men in those suits tearing apart Three Mile Island because that, that, that pile is damaged and it is still active after all these years. 1983, was it? Whenever it was, the pile is still active. So if we could put men in suits that would sustain the, the my God, it goes up to three gigs of, of, of electron energy from a heavy solar particle or a cosmic ray and inside the pits it's only 18 megs which is magnitudes of order less so if it, you had a suit that would sustain stop the solar radiation then you could put a guy very easily inside a pit and say go in there and pull that pile apart let's get rid of that stuff Heenan and Harvey were writers that uh, examined very critically NASA and some of their claims and, and how they got to send the ships out. And one of the things that they had to say was about the Grissom, Chaffee, and White disaster. Their actual lit and literal practically practical cremation when the, the capsule got on fire on Pad 34. Uh, one of the problems that had led up to this was the fact that Grissom gotten to the point where he said the capsule was never going to go to the moon. It was so poorly constructed, everything was wrong with it. And uh, he was scheduled for what they call a plugs-in test. And a plugs-in test is where they have live electrical circuits, and you're actually pushing these little switches that have power. And every time you push your switch, I don't know whether you know this or not, even at low voltage, a little tiny spark jumps from the inductive effect of the circuit be beyond it. And they had naturally these these tests allegedly as it claims today were always conducted in a hundred percent atm atmospheric oxygen atmosphere unlike our atmosphere which is eighty percent nitrogen and only twenty percent oxygen now at some time during this very very long test uh, all kinds of problems kept creeping up 
they smelled something burning and they would stop the test and they would unbolt the brand new hatch that the first time they had ever used this hatch it took 20 minutes to open up under good circumstances and they would go poking around and they wouldn't find anything burning so they rebolt the hatch and the test would go on and sometime I guess it was 5 30 6 o'clock at night everybody was dog tired these guys had been laying on those stupid couches for hours and hours and hours and hours and uh, suddenly a fire broke out but in the meantime during the last part of that test, and it was on, they were on the end, they were almost through, somebody decided to pressure test that lead. And to pressure test it, they jacked in 100% oxygen and just kept the pressure going up. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, but someplace in my readings, it's my understanding that the instant you put people in even 14.7 pounds of pure oxygen, you're asking for medical problems. Now, NASA had conducted tests years and years before on 100% oxygen environments. And each time they did a test, it turned deadly. I mean, and these were at low pressure. These were at five pounds, uh, six, seven pounds. And, and one man was taken out of the test chamber with his arm on fire. The fat and flesh of his arm was burning. They had thrown an, a, a, an asbestos blanket around that arm. And the blanket was burning because it was pure oxygen. Now, anybody that's ever had a chemistry course, all the welders in the world know about pure oxygen. It seems that everybody but NASA knew the dangers of dealing with pure oxygen and letting electricity get anywhere near around it, except NASA. So when you put human beings in a high oxygen, or in this case, 100% oxygen atmosphere, and you have them throwing live switches, and the switches are not explosion-proof switches, which probably wouldn't even be in an oxygen atmosphere anyway. But you're sitting there and you're saying, was this the spark that started? No. Nope. Was this the spark that started? They burn. They were killed. They're dead. And in my book, I call it murder. Every time our astronauts went up, there couldn't have been any solar flares. And if they were, they're all dead. Now, I, I've got information from NOAA after a, my God, it was a year's struggle about the solar flares. I never got exactly what I wanted, and my computer got virus the second time around when I threatened to go to my congressman to get this information. Whoa, looks like your little Easter Bunny ears have been clipped now, doesn't it there, you crazy nosolytic cotton pick environment to slack asses? Uh, uh, I think so. There is a fellow there named McKenna, who in 1972, we were subjected to the biggest uh, solar flare of the entire century, and he did a whole book on it. Which I, I have my hands on. And it turns out that there are so many solar flares, even at the low end of the cycle. In fact, 1972, when they had the biggest flare ever, was the low end of the cycle, the solar cycle, it's called. That, as McKinnon says, a probability of 10 to 20 percent should be considered a low probability for class M events. That's medium flares. So out of every 10 flares, you're going to get one or two which are medium. And the X-ray, he claims at least 1% will be class X, the deadliest of storms. So out of 100 storms, you will get one monster, okay, which will produce those hundreds of thousands of REM. Now, I also happen to have a chart here that I extracted from the McKinnon, the information I got from Noah, some of it from McKinnon. And it turns out that for all the trips, for missions 8 through 17, including 13, which had to go and come back, that there had to be 1,485 flares total. This is a statistical average, okay? Now, at 1,485, that means that 14 were humongous X-rated flares. That means that, I don't know, what is it, three, 400 were medium flares on all these trips, of course. But there was one, two, three, four, eight, eight or nine trips. So we're talking 1.4 X-rays, X-rated. I'm sorry, for for the for the uh, for each trip, and we're talking maybe 10 flares medium for each trip. Why any one of them would have killed everybody on board? Early on, uh, Alan Shepard went on a ballistic orbit, which is not an orbit around the Earth, it's just ballistic. You go up, you come down like a cannon shell. He was the first American. 
Shortly thereafter, Gus Grissom, the guy that was later cremated, uh, he, he was the second to do the same thing in ballistic orbit. The third was John Glenn, who is currently, I still believe, the Ohio senator. But those missions were real missions. What happened, happened. These people did them. There's no way around that. But we get to the Gemini missions, and someplace down the pike, uh, in Gemini 6A, Wally Shearer and Tom Stafford, who later went on to head NASA, became a general, the whole bit, are seen, I have a, I have a photo in my book, where this Gemini capsule is sitting in the ocean, there's a frog man, he's talking on a radio, a handset, which is not a handset, it's a type that you plug into a jack. The jack is plugged into the Gemini. Okay, so he's using the Gemini radio to talk to a helicopter, which obviously is right above his head, otherwise he couldn't be there. Now, in the front of this capsule, hanging up there maybe 15, 16 feet, is a fiberglass antenna bolted into the Gemini capsule, which had allegedly just re-entered from orbiting the Earth for a day or a week or whatever the time period was. Now, when you re-orbit, you have this very fiery re-entry bit, which gave them a lot of problems, and they had to put uh, tiles on the shuttle, and the Gemini missions had to come in fat nose and forward, and there was an ablative shield there, which means that the shield starts to get hot and pieces of it flake off and fly away and take the heat with it. But a fiberglass antenna would have been chewed up so fast, you can take a common household match and without any wind blowing and put it under some fiberglass and it probably will start to burn. And once it starts to burn, it ain't easy to put out. So how could that fiberglass antenna have re-entered because NASA tells us that those temperatures are 5,000 degrees. When a silly little match will set it on fire. Once you jump down, we had walkie-talkies from the Second World War. Once you find the thing, that helicopter over your head has a radio powerful enough to go right around the world. Okay? What the hell do you need to carry an extra antenna and another radio for? What did they do? Go inside the hatch and install the radio that the guy's obviously using from a, from a jack? through that antenna? It doesn't make sense. Nobody would do that. You got the thing, you want to put a rope around it as quick as you can before the, the ocean slops into the hatch and takes it to the bottom like Grissom's went to the bottom. In Carrying the Fire, all right, Michael Collins wrote the book, allegedly, and there are two photos in here. They're black and whites. One photo covers two pages. They're, they've since I ripped them out to develop, do what I had to do with them. But one photo covered two pages, and the other one covered one. The two-page photo showed him in the zero-G airplane. Now, it's called the zero-G airplane because it throws an outside loop, and during the time of that outside loop, which can be, I, I think it's as high as 20-some seconds, everything in there has no gravity on it, so you can float around. It's all padded up so that it, when it comes out of that thing, that no matter where you are, there is now a bottom, and you will fall hard. So it has huge mattresses sewn into the fuselage, and it has uh, guys that just, they're, they're strapped in and they do nothing but try to grab you to keep you from going through the hull of the airplane. But anyway, this is how they practice for space. So sometime before the Gemini 10 mission, which I believe was 67, Michael Collins had to go through this procedure. And he did, and they took a picture, which uh, he finally printed in his book. Well, during Gemini 10, he took a spacewalk, and he puts this other picture in his book showing him doing the spacewalk. Well, the problem is that when you look at one and three, four pages later you see the other, most people go right by it. But I saw something, I said, this is strange. The, the nylon strapping on his rigging had formed an exact same angle as on the other page. So I went back and I looked and I looked at this one. And then I looked at the horrified expression on his face in the zero G airplane. And I said, oh my God, that's like I look with if you put me on a... Uh, one of those rides that turn you upside down real fast. And I look back at the other one, the uh, Gemini 10 spacewalk picture, and I see the same expression on his face. The angle of the nylon strapping is the same, the expression is the same. Well, for the fact, except for the fact that one picture is looking that way and the other one's looking the other way, the body posture is the same, the arms are the same, the propulsion rod is the same, except now he's using a different hand. So on a whim, I tore both of those pictures out of, the, out of his book, took them to a photographic studio, and I had the big picture 
shrunk a little bit and flopped over. And I had the little picture, expanded a little bit, and that's all. Then when I took the negative of the big picture, which had been shrunk and flopped, and put it over the picture formed by the other negative, there was a direct point-to-point -point coincidence and match. And when I took the, the Gemini 10 negative, the new one I had made from these pictures, and put it on top of the zero-G airplane picture I had made, there was again a point-to-point -point coincidence indicating within a probability of one in trillions that this is the same picture. Only on one they blacked out the fuselage, they blacked out the mattresses, and they blacked out the, the guys trying to stop them from falling bad. And then he said, look, we took this on Gemini 10. The problem is that if you actually do something, you don't fake the picture. And here we have fake pictures. And this is prior to, to any Apollo mission at all. When Al Shepard went to the moon, he took a golf ball with him. And he also took a thing that uh, you could hit the golf ball with. It wasn't a club, it was a ready, handy made thing. And anyway, there's the camera behind him, and Al's there, and he's talking to Houston, base. And the conversation, if I recall, that I've seen on these TV blurbs that they always used to show us anyway, before I wrote my book, uh, he was talking to Capcom, and uh, he said, now nah, I'm going to hit this little ball, first shot, golf shot on the moon or something like that. And he smacks that ball, and I believe the first time it bobbled, and the second time he got a good whack at it, and the thing took off downrange, and the camera's behind him, so you can see it going a ways out there, and then very slowly it came off and started to curve to the right. Capcom says, that looks like a slice to me, huh? Okay. Now, since then, since I wrote my book, I have no longer seen that shot. I have been told by other people that uh, two years ago he went on a radio station somewhere in the D.C., Washington, D.C. area, and he said, oh, no, my, he says, uh, a golf ball can't curve in space, which is the point I make exactly in my book. There's no air. He says what it did was... Uh, what do you call it? You have a ball that just skids off the end of your club sideways. Anyway, when you hit it and it skids off the edge of your club sideways, the camera behind you can't see that ball disappear. It's gone, like right now. Whack! You barely see it start, it's gone. And I just saw another one at home. I have another film taken from that period of time, but allegedly. But now the camera is to his side when he hits that ball. How could this be? So either they had two cameras filming that thing, or they just added a camera recently. I don't know which it is, but I can tell you this, that no golf ball can turn, can curve in space, in the vacuum of space, because that is the Bernoulli principle, and it needs air, 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 air.